By the time they were adults, their bloodlust was unquenchable. The harps came to love a tomahawk. They developed a love for fulfilling a bone crush on the head of that axe. This is coming right upon you, face to face. This is fiendish beyond belief. They make Jack the Ripper look like nothing. There's no time. No. Clock. Hey, we're back again, you guys. It's Tuesday, and it's episode 112. Yeah, I know. They're just zooming by. I know. Like I said, the years just go on and yeah. on, and soon you pass away. No, stop it. <laughs> Well, that's, time what, to die. that's what you always sound like when you're yeah. like talking about how old you're. Yeah, like, okay, you know, I'm I old got, too, but I'm not worried about I it. I got time to die. I don't worry about it. It's not like there's anything you can do about it, is there? No, uh -huh. Nope, there isn't. All right, so episode 112. We're actually, I wanted to do another true crime, but since so many people had been requesting that we do the Harp Brothers, America's first serial killers, as they are known. I kind of wanted to get around to doing them, and also because I want to do kind of a whole historical true crime thing, I also want to talk about female serial killer Belle Gunnis, also from the early days of American history. These killers, um, I'm actually surprised they're not better known because they killed a shit ton more people than, <laughs> than a lot of the modern ones yeah. that you hear about. Um, and, it, you know, they were pretty ruthless, and like I said, so I kind of like the whole historical aspect of that, so we'll be talking about that on this episode. Yeah. But before we do that, let's do our regular shout-outs. Yeah. Uh, as I said, my book, The Faceless Villain, Volume 2, is now out in print and ebook. Yeah, and you can actually see it on her author page. Yeah, now. like I said, I had to link it yeah, too. Yeah, I had to link Because I forgot. Wow. You know, if you do Amazon, you have Author Central. If so you're an author on there and you have to like add it to my library. Otherwise, it doesn't do it automatically, I don't think. Or yeah, it, it will, but it takes a long time to do Same it. Same with Zazzle. Zazzle was acting up, but you can go... You can explain Zazzle. Yeah, a bunch of people complain. They're like, hey, we can't, we followed the link of, from your Zazzle store and we can't see, uh, you know, the like the Atlanta Ripper shirt and some of the Demon Child shirt and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there going, what the fuck is the problem? Yeah, like, I had, can see them. You had to sign in to see them. Yeah, it's like some people said, well, if I signed in with Facebook or with Google, then I could see them. Right. It's because, and I only just discovered this yesterday, that apparently you have to give your shirts a G rating. And G, then, P, G, or R. And then, yeah, there's know. ratings for the shirts. So right. if you give them uh, anything higher than a G rating, then people have to be signed in to see to them. To see them. Because so, so, I guess they right. don't want little kids seeing them or whatever. So they we fixed it. We fixed it. They're all whatever. rated G. Yeah, so I rated them all G. So eventually you should be able to see them all still at this waiting point. on four of them to become yeah, four visible. of them are still visible but if you uh don't want to wait for them to become visible if you sign in to you'll zazzle using uh facebook yeah. or google i believe then you should be able to see all of them there should be 16 things on there yeah i was wondering why shirt sales sucked i couldn't <laughs> understand because they were invisible yeah, Basically. that's like, I, I never would have thought of that in a million right. years because I kept, you know, marking the visibility. I'm like, it's public and it's like, I can see yeah. it. So why can't anybody else see them? We're going to come know. up with some newer uh, designs too. I want a black one with all white, you know, have some dude maybe running with Kugel Khan or something with a lit with a liquor motif and it'll be like some Mexican stuff on there and it kind of gothed out. You know what I mean? Something that I would wear. You know, if yeah. I'm riding on my motorcycle, something I'd wear. You know, or I'd wear at the club. So something that has to look badass. It has to look badass. Kind of yeah. like punk rock or goth kind of looking. You know what I'm talking <laughs> about? That's how I want it to look. Yeah, I'll, get, I'll get around to doing that. I'll come up with that. some other stuff. Yeah, we'll come up with some cool shit, you know. But yeah, so uh, Faceless Villain 2, I've actually recorded all but two chapters. So I just have two more chapters to record, and then i got to edit it, and then I'm going to start uploading it. So it should probably be like two, two and a half weeks, and then that the audiobook should be up as well. Uh, so if you are waiting for the audiobook, then... It won't be that much longer that you have to wait. Uh, Do if you have you, any reviews on your book yet? No. No not, reviews? No, not yet. Where the hell's the reviews, people? Yeah, come on. We sold a lot of them already. And we just, and done. actually I was just on, um, I don't think the show, I don't know if it's going to be up yet, but uh, I was just on Conspiranormal with Adam Sane uh, podcast, and I was talking about a bunch of the cases that are in this new book. Yeah, he's reading it, isn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. And actually we're just we're just talking about like the first half of the book because he's like I didn't get all the way through it because it's so long, you know. And he's right. like I didn't get all the way through it before I interviewed you. So so let's just do the first half and then we'll do the other half like in a month or What's something. What's he thinking about it? What's he thinking? He likes it. Uh, yeah, I guess he really yeah. enjoyed it. And like there was a lot of crimes in there that he didn't know about right. even though he was really interested in the ones that occurred um there were some that occurred in the 60s in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, like a bunch of little girls, and uh, they, he was kind of interested in those because he hadn't really uh, heard that much about them. And he lived like right nearby where it happened. After Jenny did the show, he, he called me in to do like some bonus material for, for Patreon, his, for yeah. his patrons and everything. I got, I went off the hook. I went off the chain. You usually do. I was do. drinking. Yeah, yeah. Was, you, were just, you were funny. just, you were just. Funny. <laughs> no, he was just ranting. You know how he does. Yeah. Like when he drinks it, he just. I went off on Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was Went yeah. We were mostly movies. talking about movies because that's yeah. what he was asking about. He was he was asking about uh, his uh, shitty movies yeah. uh, Facebook group. Yeah, and I was and talking stuff. about T two. My problems with T two. Leather daddies, the little boys like on the back of the motorcycle. I, I don't did like when that it came shit. Out. It's like I it was. I know what a leather daddy is. Well, yeah. Putting no. them little boys on the back of the motorcycle. We know how Hollywood is nowadays, man. Is they trying to send me? Cameron's trying to send us underground subliminal messages. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, uh, again, I would never it, put a little boy on the back of my bike hugging up on me like that, face, face <laughs> sideways, eyes closed. You know what I mean? With his floppy ass, nice yeah, hair. Yeah, man, it looked like yeah, floppy hair and shit, man. Yeah, I just, you Damn. know, whatever. But uh, yeah, so anyway, speaking of movies, um, as I said, we've been using our AMC Stubbs A list yeah, subscription. It, right it, yeah, it turned yeah. out really uh, we shit. We've already made our money back, burning and, it up, and some burning it up because we saw all three of our movies last week. The last one we yeah. saw was The Nun. I uh, love that app. Yeah, it's that great. app is really cool. It's really easy to use. Yeah, and it's like, uh, yeah, we saw the nun, which was in the Conjuring universe, obviously. That was actually that actually wasn't pretty bad. good. We're pretty the good. only ones in the theater. Yeah, we went and saw. And, it and you know what? The Meg. We saw the Meg. I, I wouldn't pay to see the Meg. The Meg is still in theaters. Yeah, it's it still is. in AMC. It's made f over five hundred and twenty-five well, million. It's a big monster movie. They People thought love it was gonna. They thought that Hollywood thought that shit was gonna bomb. That's a Chinese movie. Yeah, well, right. well they had like, a lot oh, of well, American actors in there. Too, yeah, right? but they they were like, well, actors. it's it's such a dumb movie. It's not sophisticated. It, it probably won't make but about forty million in an opening week. You know, it just shows you that Hollywood doesn't know what it's doing, man. The Chinese knew what a successful movie should look like. They well, called it. The Chinese called it. They said, well, we want a conventional monster movie. Yeah, I mean, make it a guy. He's got some muscles. You know what I mean? This, you know, it's just it's it's so basic, and they ate it up. Yeah. It's still in the theaters. I mean, it wasn't a great movie, but when it was all right. It was entertaining. Just fun. Yeah. It was just like, fun. honestly, I like The Predator and The Nun uh, yeah. a lot better. But um, yeah, The Meg wasn't bad. Now this week, for this week coming up, like I said, you have three movies a week uh, per person. So we're going to see, what are we seeing? We're seeing The Mission, Mission Impossible, Impossible. Fallout. We're seeing uh, uh, Hellfest. Hell, Hellfest. Which is like a, a slasher movie. You see Venom in three And we'll probably see uh, Venom. But we're going to yeah. go in the middle of the week because I don't yeah. want to go at night when there's like 50 bajillion people. Yeah, I like the A-list thing. You know, you can go on, you can go during the day, you know, and you can see off-brand movies. It doesn't really cost any extra. You can't watch 12 movies a month, really. There's not enough, not enough movies. Yeah, there might not be enough uh, starting. It's like we might have to go see some of them twice or something just yeah, so we don't feel like we're wasting like, money. Well, let's go <laughs> see this one because some of those I have no interest in. Yeah, and but, uh, uh, it's a pretty nice program. I mean, yeah. it's as it's it, it's as good as Shutter. Shutter was a real good deal too. Five dollars a month. And that's the we're, we're, man. We're abusing the shit out of that. Burning up show. Well, we watched like four movies last night. Yeah, on Xbox. On my Xbox. Yeah, app. it was like well, it was Friday night. We were drinking, like eating some peanuts, and yeah, you know, big thing of peanuts. We, what did we watch? We watched the Howling, the Howling which yeah. we're probably going to do a review of. Yeah. Um, Black Sabbath uh, yeah. with Boris Karloff. Uh, we also watched Zombie. Zombie. Well, part of it. You don't part have to watch of, yeah. the, the Lucio Fulci one because I haven't seen that for many years. Uh, we probably do a review on that too. And Exorcist Three. Which was actually, yeah. oh, it's, I remember that being really good, but I'm like, shit, man, that movie was creepy as fuck. I forgot all about it. Pretty cool. Yeah, George C. Scott was in that shit. It's all classy and everything, just like the yeah. Changeling. But yeah, I really like that movie a lot. So yeah, Shudder's uh, really, also a, a really good value. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, yeah. As usual, if you'd like to financially support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, which I'll tell you later, or you can go to our blog uh, and go to the PayPal link in the little sidebar there if you'd like to give a one-time donation. Also, time is running out. If you would like your Halloween stories, whether horror fiction or whether true paranormal or whatever, just as long as it's a scary story, um, if you would like that read on our Halloween Spooktacular special, 
then you need to email me that shit at gravecake at gmail.com. You have maybe yeah. a week or two uh, to send it to him because we're actually going to record it a little bit early, yeah. um, you know, so I can get everybody. Because we might have some guests on the show and we're trying to, like, coordinate when people can come we're over. We're going to have a little Halloween party. Yeah, and stuff like that. So, yeah, we're going to we're gonna read the stories and we're going to, like, have, you know, start our friends over for Halloween and stuff like that. So, yeah. um if you would like them read, then go ahead and email them to me. And also, if you're one of our $20 and up patrons and you haven't sent me your uh, shirt and the size you want and stuff like that, then you probably need to do that soon because I'm going to start ordering the shirts over the next uh, few months. Because like I said, we wanted to order them like a few at a time just yeah. so, so, it doesn't hit us so it doesn't hit us all at once like the, the expense. We got new lighting. Yeah, well, we just it's the same just lighting. We just around. moved it. That way we we don't look like we're a million years old. I yeah I wanted a beautiful soft glow. Yeah, yeah that works. <laughs> I'll probably put that one over here. Well, we had been having the light behind us, and I'm just like, man, I look like a hag. I don't need to just cause yeah. I don't really look like a hag. I don't just think your lines in your face look like a million miles deep. Yeah, they that's don't look like... as bad in this, with, the, with the light over here. We need yeah. lighting in front of us. That's what I'm telling you. You need lighting in front, man. Yeah. Behind you, that's that's not good. Unless yeah. you just wanted to go total silhouette, so no one can see my face at all. Yeah. <laughs> that might work too. All right, so. Let's uh, start out. I'm not going to do a news story since we're doing two uh, different cases. So we're just going to do, I'll probably do the Hart Brothers first and then we'll take a break and then I'll talk about Bell Gunnis after the break. Yeah, I don't know any, either now one of see... these cases. So, you know, I'm just along for the ride. What else is new? Oh, stop. <laughs> oh, stop. It's like, I don't, I don't know anything. You just talk. I don't know. I'm going to sit here and just ride along, make, com make silly comments. Make silly comments. I'm kind of like the comedic relief around here. <laughs> So, as I said, they are generally known as the Harp Brothers, even though they're not sure if they actually were brothers. They might have been cousins. Right. So, these two guys have the distinction of being the U.S.'s first known serial killers. Their names were Micaiah Harp and Wiley Harp. Uh, Micaiah was known as Big Harp and Wiley was known as Little Harp because one was much larger right. other than the other one, obviously. Now... They're either, like I said, this was a very long time ago. This was the late 1700s. Damn, that long ago. Yes. So, sources differ. They were either born in Scotland and emigrated to the United States with their families, uh, you know, when they were children, or they were born here, like, shortly after their families uh, moved here. But they were of Scottish descent. Like many uh, of Scottish descent from the area where they came from, they were, uh, you know, in the whole American Revolution type thing leading up to that, they were loyalists. They were loyal to the British crown. That explains it. Which, yeah, which kind of made them, I mean, their neighbors didn't, didn't like, like them so right. much. Uh, so the story goes. So there is some, there has been some speculation. And like I said, a lot of legends have grown up about these two guys. So they're not sure entirely. One, they're not really entirely sure how many people they killed. It was a lot. Um, but they also are not really sure like what, like why they did what they did. Or so there may have been a political motive as well. Where, yeah. Well, they're just saying that because their family was kind of uh, reportedly targeted by, you know, American colonists, American, you know, patriots, as they called them, who were, you know, anti-British, um, then that might have contributed to their... Um, Hatred towards the ...problems yeah. later on, yeah. <laughs> where they pretty much... They, they're serial killers in the sense that they kill dozens of people, but the interesting thing about it is that they didn't have a particular victim profile. They'd pretty much just kill any motherfucker that got right. in their way or pissed them off. Um, they had, they seem to have no conscience, no scruples, no nothing. Um, you know, and y you're, you're talking about the late 1700s in the American frontier. Um, you know, there's highwaymen, there were pirates, uh, there were various other things where people just kill you and take your shit and it yeah. wasn't really that big of a deal. But these two, um, are kind of a cut above because they seem to enjoy it. Uh, they didn't always do it for a particular motive of like, I'm just going to take your stuff. They did, but um, that wasn't the only reason. It seemed like they actually really liked it. And plus they did a lot of like mutilations and stuff that were not necessary. Hmm. So that's why they call them America's first serial killers. So they think that, like I said, they came from, uh, they came from Scotland. Now they, um, at some point, they're not real sure uh, what years they were born. Uh, they think Micaiah, who was Big Harp, was born sometime before 1768. 
and uh, Wiley Little Harp was born sometime before 1770, but they're not entirely sure. Now, in about 1775, uh, they were actually living in North Carolina. Their families had emigrated to North Carolina. In 1775, they went to Virginia and they were going to get work as overseers on a slave plantation. So they kind of, what they did, they got in with these other loyalist groups or irregulars, they also called them. Yeah. And by some accounts joined a rape gang like Irre you do. Irregulars. That was basically mercenaries. Yeah. All right. So in at, support of the crown. Yeah. Yeah. So they joined this group that would just basically go around raping and pillaging, yeah. um, attacking colonists, burning down their stuff, taking their shit, raping their women, that type of stuff. Yeah. So that's kind of where these two guys were at. Yeah. If, in other words, if there was a town that they thought was going to be disloyal to the crown, they'd send these guys in here to punish them. Yes. Punish them. Basically, the Hessians were doing the same thing. Yeah. Similar type They're of kind thing. They're kind of like a Hessian. Yeah. So... Uh, in about this time, uh, there are speculations that Little Harp attempted to rape a girl in North Carolina who, and then he was shot by, uh, a man named Captain James Wood, but he was just wounded. He didn't die, unfortunately. Mm. So then the next that they know of them, cause like I said, they kind of moved around and they, you know, there's stretches where they don't really know where they were. In 1780... Uh, they actually joined with regular uh, the regular British Army. Um, they actually were not paid. They didn't have uniforms or anything like that. But like you said, they were mercenaries. Um, yeah. So they kind of had to steal all their own supplies and whatnot. So they joined with some troops, some British troops, and they were in a bunch of battles uh, around the North and South Carolina borders. Then, uh, about a year after that, uh, they joined in with a renegade group of Cherokee who were actually fighting with the British. These were the uh, Chickamauga Cherokee Indians. And so they, um, so they, uh, all of those same kind of thing, these Indians and the Harps would go around raiding settlements and everything. Now, at this stage, they decide they're going to take revenge on Captain Wood, the guy that shot Little Harp after the rape. So they kidnapped his daughter, who was named Susan, and then they kidnapped this other woman named Maria Davidson, and they made them become their wives. You know what I mean? Yeah. So both of them, yeah, by all accounts, they shared these two women. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know, like, in later speculation is kind of like, how much complicity did these women have uh, with these guys' crimes and everything? Because they kind of traveled with them for a very long time. But, you know, I don't know. The fact that they were kidnapped in the be beginning, I'm kind of thinking, you know, whatever. They might well, have they were like... supposedly kidnapped. Don't know. Yeah, that was well, just a story that they gave. Yeah, I, like I said, yeah. I don't know. It was don't so long know. ago. Right. So then, during this uh, time, so the two of them and the women, and then there were four other guys who, they don't know who they were, but they were just like other gang members. So then they start heading toward Tennessee. Now, while they're along this trip, there's this guy, and his name is Moses Doss. And he was actually worried about the safety of the women or like what was going on with them. And he apparently uh, foolishly said something about it. Like, hey, why don't you let them go? Or why are you so mean to them? Or something along those lines. Um, so the Harps then killed him mm -hmm. <laughs> as they would do, you know, subsequently. So then. Right now, I must, I must say at this point, this is not normal mercenary behavior. You know what I mean? This, no, this obviously kind of not. not no. That's why this shit stuck right. out. Yeah, yeah. They're, That's why they remember didn't them. didn't do this regularly. No. This is not what, not what like I said, these guys right. were not... It wasn't a kind of thing where we just killed people for supplies right. or whatever. Because there was a lot of people doing that. Like I said, there was pirates. It was all kind of stuff. Where they were just killing people because they wanted their stuff. Uh, these two uh, would just kill people for the hell of it. Yeah. Mercenaries are just professional soldiers. Yeah. And the United States Army is a professional army. So you tit... And there's non-U.S. citizens in the Army. So, you know, when I was in, I was basically serving with mercenaries, some of them. Guys from Ireland, guys from Mexico. They weren't even U.S. citizens. Yeah. They were just working for a paycheck, and they had permission to be in there. They get citizenship later on. You yeah. Know, that kind of stuff. But, yeah, so, like I said, these two are not... Right, no, yeah, nothing not like normal, that. not normal. These no. guys were just... It almost sounds like this is something having to do with some of the Indian wars. Because this kind of shit was going on with, like you said, irregulars. Yeah. Professional soldiers being hired... To 
uh, you know, hired by certain empires. Sometimes Indians were hired by certain empires to get certain things done because it was just so hard to get a European army into the New World, you know? Yeah. Because, you know, the, the, the it's cost. It's a long way. The long way <laughs> and the cost. It's a big ocean. So, so you recruit and hire guys there on site, you know what I mean? But it, this is weird. This is This is a weird time, you know? This is almost like a post-apocalyptic world, you know? Uh, that this is going on in, in forests with yeah. no central government and, and competing governments in the same territory and then tribes. Yeah. It's, a, you know, so this is, uh, you know, there like was something a lot out of, of Mad Max. Yeah, really. there was a lot of lawlessness. Yeah. And these two guys Chaos. took full advantage. Right. I'm actually uh, surprised that more people didn't. But the fact that these two, and as I'll say later on, even some like mercenaries and pirates and stuff like that were like, oh, whoa, okay, you guys, just yeah. like too much. Okay. Chill. <laughs> yeah. It was so. It was that you. You know they were bad if people were hunting them and like during this period. <coughs> yeah. So after they killed uh, Moses Doss, um, then they went to there was this um, Cherokee Chickamauga village called Nickajack. Um, it's kind of near where Chattanooga is today in Tennessee, and they lived in this village uh, for about twelve or thirteen years. Um, during this period, the two wives. Um, actually got pregnant uh, twice. I don't know if that's twice each or once each. Right. I'm not really sure. The, it's not real clear. Um, reportedly, all of these children uh, were killed by their fathers. Because they'd kill babies, too. They didn't, give a, they didn't give a single fuck. Late term abortion. Yeah, I guess, very late. Yeah, very late. Yeah. I don't know how old the children were when they killed them. They didn't have time for that. I guess not. Yeah. Um, okay, so 1781, the British surrender at Yorktown, the Chickamauga, and another uh, band of Cherokees that were kind of like breakaway and they're, uh, you know, loyal to the British crown still, um, they're kind of, kind of fighting the colonists and everything like that. So the Harps decided to throw in their lot with them and also, you know, kept fighting against the colonists. They were actually in the Battle of Blue Licks in Kentucky. That was in August 1782 and a bunch of other little battles around that time. So now in 1794, in autumn, um, the colonists were actually going to attack uh, this village in Nickajack and fight with the Indians, the Loyalist Indians. So the, somehow the Harp brothers, or cousins or whatever, big and little Harp, um, they found out about this and got the fuck out of Dodge. Uh, meanwhile, the colonists wiped out the village so the next that they know of Big and Little Harp was uh, in this other camp that wasn't too far away, but they stayed there about nine months. And then they would go around to like local villages, like pillage them and like take all their shit and everything like that. Next they know of them was in 1797 and they were living in um, Beaver's Creek, like on the shores of Beaver's Creek, like in this little cabin that was near uh, present day Knoxville. And they still had the two wives, like I said, that had been they're pregnant a lot of times like during this whole thing and like i said they shared both of them but at this point little harp uh marries another woman this is a third woman and her name is sarah rice and there is record of that so they were officially married the other two like i said not so much they were just like the other ones are basically slaves yeah that's they're, what they're saying. essentially they're sex right, slaves yeah. but this woman he uh little harp did actually marry and uh, she was the daughter of a minister. So she uh, essentially just started traveling around with them, just like the other ones. Now, they had killed people prior to this, obviously. But the real spree of murder did not really start until 1798. And it started in Tennessee. Uh, they killed two guys there. Then they went to Kentucky and killed two more men who were just traveling along the road, killed them and took their shit. Um, the thing that they would do, like I said, they weren't just shooting people and taking their stuff. They were killing them and then they were cutting them open, filling their abdominal cavities with stones and leaving them in a creek, like for people to find, like really gruesome, like mutilation. And were they doing that to them while they were alive? Did um, I'm not really sure. Maybe. It sounds like something they would do. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It almost sounds like they had been in contact with some of those, uh, some of the more aggressive Indian tribes. Yeah, they that did like, like some, some Indians fucked up. Do. Yeah, they did. Some Indians fucked liked up shit torture like that. too. They learned it. They evidently picked it up from the Spanish. And some of those Indian tribes would do weird things like you know flay you alive using sharpened seashells, bury you alive in ant mounds, and watch you get picked apart. You know that kind of stuff. 
Isn't that nice? Well, you yeah. know, if there isn't any law and order, you have to, you know, you, sometimes you have to drop your nuts using terror. You know what I mean? Well, that, Don't come in here or we do this to you. That's essentially what these two are doing. Right. Although I'm not sure, like I said, they didn't really seem to have an end game in particular. Um, they were opportunists. They would kill people and take their stuff if they wanted yeah. it. But they did seem to like to kill people, like I said, just for the fun of it. It seemed yeah. like. Well, I kind of already have an idea who it is you're dealing with. I mean, I don't know how much you have left, but I can give you my opinion when you're done. Okay. I pretty much made, I pretty much had kind of figured it out in my mind who these guys are. Okay, so the next guy they killed was a guy named John Lanford, who was actually traveling uh, on the road from Virginia to, to Kentucky. Now, at this stage, there was an innkeeper who suspected that Big and Little Harp were responsible for this guy's murder. So he gets the law around to check these two guys out. Now, for a while, the authorities did capture them and put them in jail in Danville, Kentucky. But they got out. Now, all three of the women that were with them were pregnant at the time, so they left them in the jail because, you know, they, they were very heavily pregnant. And they, they had the women, to, they, 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 they imprisoned the women too? Yes, okay. because they were with them. So they figured they were like accomplices. Um, yeah. So the, the pregnant women were left behind. They actually, as far as I know, they all gave birth while they were uh, still in custody. The children were about two months apart each. Okay, so Big and Little Harp escape. Then they send a posse after them. Now, evidently the son of a guy that was helping the lawmen find the two guys, he was also later found dead and mutilated. So the Harps had killed him in revenge uh, for this guy helping them out. He's like, I'm going to kill your son and mutilate him. So for a while, they didn't know where they were. The governor of Kentucky put a $300 reward on each of their heads, which was like quite a bit of money back then, obviously. So while they're fleeing north uh the brothers killed two more men uh, a guy named edmonton and a guy named stump then they were at the um they came upon a camp on the banks of the saline river and there was like three guys just like in a little encampment there, just minding their own bees beeswax and of course the harps killed all of them also they then went to southern illinois this place called cave in the rock Cave in the Rock was actually a well-known, uh, was the well-known base of a river pirate named Samuel Mason. And he had a gang and him and his little pirates, what they would do, they would be like these flat boats, you know, that had all these supplies on them and they would be going down the Ohio River and, you know, the pirates would stop them and kill everybody and take all their shit. So the Harps are hanging out with this pirate gang. Now, at this stage, like I said, this is a pirate gang, and Samuel Mason is a very, very well-known river pirate. They did some horrible things. Even they, when the Harps started doing their thing, they were just like, yo, bros, is yeah. like that, no. Just why? Because yeah. you know what the Harps would like to do? Sometimes they would get people, they would take them up to the top of the rock, because it's like this little cave, it's like a natural formation, it's like this big rock at the top with like a river on the bottom. They would take them up to the top of the rock. They would strip all their clothes off. Then they would tie them to a horse or put them on a horse so they couldn't get off. They would blindfold the horse and then make the horse run off the cliff. <laughs> so they liked, they, like I said, they enjoyed uh, torture. They enjoyed tormenting people. Right. And it, like I said, even the pirates were just like, that's, that's not cool. It's like, why go to all that trouble, really, I suppose? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So well, for the most part, you know, when people say pirate, you think in these wild outlaws, that's not really the case. You had to have a license to be a pirate. People yeah. forget that. And I don't know if these river pirates had a license, but usually you were working in the employment of, of, of one of the empires, British Empire, Spanish Empire. They give you a license to go out there and do it. Yeah. Now, of course, whatever empire you were stealing from, they considered you a criminal, but the people who had employed you considered you to be a contractor. So, yeah. you know, You're like they got stuff, they right? They kind of had certain rules that they were supposed to follow. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know about the river pirates though. I don't know if these guys were working for anybody or if they were just bandits on they the river. They were freelance. Right. Yeah. Cause there's a difference between being a, a licensed, you know, a licensed pirate, a privateer, a privateer and somebody who was just a bandit, you know, yeah. stealing for themselves. I have a feeling these guys were just... Right, kind of winging it because a pirate Living had in a cave a, like you a, do. A true privateer pirate had to give you know a certain portion of his of the booty to the empire that he was working for. You know, you said booty. The 
booty. <laughs> you know what booty is. <laughs> I do. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting on mine right now. But yeah, so this whole shit with they where they were just like throw people off cliffs and they thought it was hilarious. So even then the pirates were like, you know, you guys just you just go away. We just, we just can't deal with this anymore. So the the pirates kicked them out. So them and the women they then go to Eastern Tennessee. This was like in summer of 1798. Now they know that they killed uh, three more people. Uh, there was a farmer and uh, named Bradbury and another guy named Hardin. And then there was like a young boy, like a teenage boy. I think he was 13. His name was uh, Coffee. Then they found another body uh, of a guy named William Ballard. Uh, he had been just like the other guy had been disemboweled, had rocks put in his uh, abdominal cavity and then thrown in a river. I wonder why they're doing that. Like I said, they liked it. They seemed like they liked it. That but was usually, one of their. That was like their signature. You disembowel somebody, it kills move. them pretty quick. Yeah. It almost, almost, almost makes me think that maybe they were just trying to wait, wait the body down. They were, but it, it seems like there's easier up. ways to do that than. Well, spending they didn't have time. chicken wire, so you couldn't wrap them in chicken wire, and I don't, I don't know why. That's yeah. just that, maybe that's not true. Maybe that's something somebody made up about them. I don't know, because that does seem to be something that it happened more than once. Like, more than one victim was found that way. Rocks in their abdomen. Yes. Yeah, like they were cut open and all their guts were taken out. Mm. Um, they also killed another guy named James Brassel, whose throat was slashed. Uh, they also found another man named John Tully, who was murdered. And then, uh, in south-central Kentucky, uh, there was a guy named John Graves, and he had a teenage son. Uh, they both had their heads axed in. Then the uh, Big and Little Harp also killed a little girl. Then they killed a teenage boy that was a slave. Then they killed an entire family that was sleeping in a camp. Just because. Then, this is nice. So then the Harps are all camping with the women and the children. Because they did travel with the three women and their attendant children. Apparently... Uh, I don't know if it was Big Harp's daughter or Little Harp's daughter, but she was like an infant uh, little girl. And she was crying, and Big Harp got annoyed and picked up the baby by her feet and smashed her against a tree. Yeah. And killed her. So Right. Probably his own daughter, yeah. Uh, It was. Yeah. (laughs) As far as they know. Well, it was either his daughter or it was the other guy's daughter, so they were all related. Because of psychos. Yeah. Yeah. Then they found another guy. This was the same month that this happened. There was a guy named Trowbridge, and he was also found disemboweled in Highland Creek. Uh, same kind of deal. And then the Harps next turn up at this house um, of a family called the Steagles. I guess they ran an inn, and the Harps were staying there. Now, while they were staying there, because they apparently just couldn't help themselves, there was another guest staying with the Steagall family. His name was Major William Love, and the Harps killed him as well. They also killed Mrs. Stiegel's four-month-old baby boy um, because he was crying. They slit his throat. Um, obviously, Mrs. Stiegel was not too happy about that and started <laughs> screaming, so they killed her as well. So, okay, at this point, like I said, there's rewards on these two guys' heads. There's posses chasing them all over the place, right? Because they're just leaving a trail of dead yeah. as they go across the states. And like I said, it's just fucked up shit. They're not stealing stuff. So, I mean, they are, but... It's not, doesn't seem to be the main reason. It seems like just kind of like bloodlust, you know what I mean? They just can't help themselves. So, yeah, the posses are coming after them. Now, the the guy whose house they were staying in when he he killed the baby and the the wife, uh, Moses Stiegel, that was obviously his wife and baby, so he was part of one of the posses that uh, that was coming after them. So they're chasing them. So the Harps, they were actually planning to kill this other settler whose name was George Smith. But in August of 1799, the posse finally caught up with the Harps. Now, Big Harp got shot in the leg and in the back. So he was wounded. So the posse like swarms him and they get on top of him. Now he's dying. So they say, so he confesses to 20 murders. Although they think there's a lot more than that. He confesses to 20. He says the only one he feels bad about is his own daughter. Right. That he smashed her head against a tree. So, hmm. Yeah. A little late for that now, buddy. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But this is hardcore. So Moses Stiegel, you know, the Harps had killed his wife and baby. Moses Stiegel slowly saws off Big Harp's head while he's still alive. 
and then takes Big Harp's head. They either put it, sources differ, they either put it on a pole or in a tree so everyone could see it. So they can say this is what happens to outlaws. Yeah. Um, you know, so they left his head there. So they're... I don't uh, understand sawing his head off. And it's yeah. a passion, you know what I mean? Guy had killed a bunch of women and children, so they yeah. were going to make him suffer. Give me that saw. And they're to hold, yeah. hold him down. You know, that's, that's what probably what he like, did. He killed yeah, his yeah. wife and baby. Yeah. For Christ's sake. Yeah. I don't blame him. Not right. one bit. That's so, the American version of, of breaking somebody on the wheel. That's the frontier yeah. version. So yeah, you Hand me that saw. Yeah, he slowly, very, yeah. very slowly sawed his head off. Yeah, we're going to saw <laughs> your head off. Now, evidently, if any of you live in Kentucky and can still tell me, I don't know yeah. if the place is still called this, but the crossroads where they displayed the head was for many years known as Harp's Head Road. Yeah. I don't know if it's still so called that. What happened to that. the other Harp? But like I said, we're, we're getting we to getting We're getting there. Right. So Little Harp... I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. See, you don't even know all the facts. Well, no, no, you're yeah, just going... Know <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't know all the facts and you're already coming up with shit. <laughs> okay, so Little Harp got away. And he actually went back to Illinois, to the Cave in the Rock, and rejoined uh, Samuel Mason, the other, the river pirates. Now, he actually lived with them, uh, they think, for about four years. Uh, he was going under an, an alias. Uh, they think it was John Sutton or John Sutton. Uh, so he was trying to hide out. Now, and this is where he got into trouble. So evidently, the authorities wanted, also wanted Samuel Mason, the river pirate. So there was a big reward to bring the head of Samuel Mason to the authorities. So Little Harp goes, ka-ching. Yeah, so, yeah. so him and this other guy named James yeah, May, kill somebody else and bring he killed yeah. Samuel Mason, the, the river pirate, and sawed yeah. his head off <laughs> and brought it to the authorities like a dumbass. And so the authorities were like, hey, that's Little Harp. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, so they didn't fall for it. No. Yeah. So him and the other pirate... They were arrested because they're like, we know who you bitches are. Right. Nice. You, it's like, you guys are idiots. Like, you know, they're criminals. It's like, how right. fucking smart can they be? So, yeah. No, now, they did escape from custody, but they recaptured them shortly afterward. And they were arrested. They were convicted. They were sentenced to hang. So, in January of 1804, both the pirate, James May, and Little Harp were executed. Their heads were also cut off and placed on stakes along the Natchez Trace Road in order to, as a warning to the others. American justice. Don't, yeah, don't do that outlaw yeah. shit. Yeah. So, okay. So how many people did they kill? Okay, confirmed, as far as I know, 39. But they think that it was more than 50. Because there were a whole lot of victims that are, like, not accounted for. Um, and they know the Harps were in that area. Or they, you know, it was a similar MO or something like that. But they know they killed at least 39 probably more than 50 men, women, children. They did not discriminate. Um, yeah. If you just got in their way or you annoyed them or pretty much any other reason, or they just had a crack across their ass yeah. that day, um, then they would just kill you. And that would be the end of it. These are not stereotypical serial killers. Though. They, they are they, not. These no. are not serial killers per se. These are just mass murderers. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, like I said, they right. it didn't have a sexual motive or right. anything like that, they're, but they they're, just, they're basically wild west outlaws. They're, early prototypes of Wild West outlaws. And uh, they're just doing what they saw, what they saw in some of these, in the revolution, and I guess you could say probably like in, in during Indian Wars. You'd probably class them, classify them as Indian Wars. Yeah, that was the kind of stuff. But they were just doing it against their own people. Although yeah. they may have not have considered these Americans, these other white people, their own people. They might have considered That's them to be traitors I'm... to traitors, and yeah. they may have been considered them. They may have considered themselves to be at war with them. I feel like there might have been an aspect of that. Like yeah. I said, it was a long time ago, and they're not entirely sure. But they think that their loyalist sympathies, like the, right. to the to the British crown, might have um, because the other the American colonists were so yeah. against them that that might have had something to do. Well, with... I can guarantee you one thing. All right, I can tell you these guys were dumb. They were dumb and they were mean. Uh, yeah. You know, so, you know, being dumb and mean and uh, having a lot of violence in your background and a lot of battle experience, especially seeing a lot of atrocities, can kind of warp the mind, you know what I mean? Kind of warp their view of what normal is, you know? I'm sure, they, sure they, you know, I'm sure they'd already seen a lot of little dead kids. Yeah. That didn't bother them. So, well, even killing their with, own kids. Yeah, didn't you're dealing them. with psychos. Well, here's the deal. 
those were kids that were that came out of their slaves. True. So they probably didn't have a connection with them emotionally, you know. Doesn't seem just, doesn't seem like they had a, com- co- yeah. a connection with anyone no. emotionally. No. <laughs> Sounds well, like they were psychopaths. Well, yeah, and I would also probably say that not only were they psychopaths, they were probably pretty dumb. They're probably talking about guys with 80 IQs. They don't probably. seem like the sharpest knives in no, the drawer. No, what would what would make you think that just because you were on in a frontier zone that you you would get away with that for very long? Well, that's the you dumb just, thing. It even just, back then, you didn't. They'd yeah. get up on you and they'd hunt you down. I mean, it took a long time, but it's like, yeah. hey, I'm going to go stay in an inn, and oh, by the way, everyone's pissing me off, so I'm just going to kill them all. Yeah. Why I mean, would you do that? History just, shows over and over again. At least try to hide it. History, American <laughs> history has shown over and over again in that period, all the way up into the, into the 1900s, you could kill an occasional person and get away with it. Yeah, of course. But if you killed lots of people, especially whole families, you know, with... <laughs> with regularity, your ass was grass. Well, yeah, they were gonna, gonna come you. after you. They're gonna find yeah. your ass. A, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the reasons why people did get away with the murders that they did back in those days, it was, it was victims, victimology. Yeah, they were killing people that were not popular. Yeah, and they also they weren't killing people in very large numbers. Yeah, and uh, you know, limited, limited ability of law enforcement, and they would just evade capture and evade detection too. You know. But doing what they're doing, wiping out whole ends and whole families, you become an enemy of humanity. They hunt you well, down. Yeah. yeah. Because think of all the people that you are making mad. Right, yeah. That you're leaving alive. Like Killing I said, innocent people is is not in your survival interest. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's why <laughs> yeah. I think these guys actually shade more towards serial killer because yeah. they killed people for no reason. Well, I think it's they were like, dumb. Dumb and cruel. And yeah. You know, it was part of it. It's like, let's just kill little kids. Let's kill innocent yeah. women. And then it's like, oh, now you get all the husbands and brothers right. and fathers of well, these people like coming after you. I think they were dumb and they wanted to steal and they thought, well, we can kill them. We can get away with it. Yeah. You know, everybody else is killing everybody. And then it just started piling you up. Know. They'll just think the Indians did it. They couldn't go like anywhere that. without killing somebody. Yeah, right. It's like, like I said, it's like they couldn't right. help themselves. So now the interesting thing about the three women that were left behind. Now, at some stage, like I said, they were actually in jail and they did stay in trial for some of the murders, like as accomplices. But because they were all pregnant or, the, you know, they all had their babies or whatever, um, the jury actually took uh, pity on them and they were released. Now, by all accounts, after the Harps died... Um, they actually kind of, you know, spread out and they actually went on to live perfectly normal, acceptable lives. Most of them remarried, um, you know, and lived somewhere else. So they didn't, you know, they didn't have like an outlaw lifestyle or anything like that. They, they well, just went and became them, respectable women. At least two of them were captives. Yes. You know, that they, I, that they know of. I mean, the third one, They went like along I said, with it, but they had to, there was no choice. I mean, that's they, what I mean. They, what, they kill their own kids. Yeah. That's what know? I mean. What are you going to do yeah, in some yeah. ways? It's like, I don't know how much I can blame that was particularly back then because women were just like cattle, man. It's like, nobody gave a shit what they wanted or anything like that. So it's like, well, we're, you're just coming along with us. And, I, and when they see what these guys are doing, yeah. it's like, what the fuck are they going to do? They don't have any money. They don't have anywhere to go. It's I, like, what, what are they going to do? They're going to leave. And it's like, although, they'll probably get killed too. Although coming out and saying during that period that women in the new world were worthless and like cattle and eh, not really not really well these ones were yeah those were i mean and what was funny is that when the women of power okay that's what if you want to put it weren't the ones you would actually expect to have power really the ones that had all the money and the power and all the freedom were some kind of what they call sporting gal well it was like or a broth- star brothel madams and yeah stuff like that a, they call them a star who was a high class? It was the same in Europe. Yeah, high class prostitute. She didn't have to get married. There were no rules on her. She was very popular. Had a lot of money. Yeah, and they she could do what she wanted. Made shit ton of money. Yeah, they could do whatever they wanted. And they could do what they wanted. They, they ran they parlors. Yeah, they weren't under the same strictures. Yeah, and they had protection of law enforcement because all the cops and all the guys loved them. Yeah. So they could do what they wanted. Same kind of thing. But like I yeah. said, these women they were the geisha of the American. These women were life. not in that situation no. by any stretch of the no. imagination. Like I said, two of them were apparently kidnapped the other one did marry the guy but i don't know how much she knew about him or if he coerced her into it who knows but like i said after the harps died they apparently went on and lived completely normal lives they remarried and you know by all accounts were totally fine so you know other than that like i said this it's really weird because i mean obviously they don't teach you about the harps in american history uh in school and i had actually never really heard of them until a bunch of people recommended this topic so thank you for recommending it because this is something I had never known about. And like I said, it's really interesting because these dudes killed at least 39 people. Probably more. I mean, you know, 
considering how long they were on the run. It must have been more than that. And we still remember Jack the Ripper, who killed five people that they know of. Yeah. You know, we still remember other serial killers that killed, you know, a dozen. But that's a lot. That's yeah. bad. But these two, these fuck. two here, these they were like a mini uh, and babies, mini catastrophe. Yeah. And like babies and stuff, like picking them up and throwing them because of fuck, man, that's like not even human. Jesus. I guarantee you they were saying, well, well, I'm going to take their shit. We'll kill them all. We'll kill them yeah. all. Yeah. They'll say the Indians did it. Yeah, they were like that. Yeah, it probably like was. Yeah. And the Indians did it. Like I said, a lot of legend has kind of grown up around these two. Um, if you see, like, the Devil and Daniel Webster, uh, which they, which is a play and then it was a movie and stuff, there are two characters in there that are based on the harps. Um, the Robber Bridegroom, which looks like a musical or a play, um, that also has a couple characters based on them. So there, there have been some stuff in pop culture... Uh, that are based on these two guys. But uh, as atrocious as their activities were, I'm just surprised that they're not better known. I mean, because look, it's like... Because it was a long time ago. Yeah, like I'm super into true crime and stuff. And I'm really into Victorian crime also. But for some reason, I didn't really... I'd kind of heard of them, but I didn't really know anything about them or who they were or anything like that. So thank you for recommending that. These several people that recommended it. Um, so I guess we're going to... Let's see what we're doing on time. Okay, shit, we're already... Okay, so we're going to take a break right now. When we come back, we will talk about yet another serial killer, female serial killer. Not many of those. And this is also from kind of the early days of history, although about a century later after the Hart Brothers. This is the infamous Belle Gunness. So we're going to take a break right now, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. shirts designs up four of them really good ones too atlanta ripper who put bella in the witch elm the hh holmes murder castle and of course demon child because man said he could these are updated designs i think they look really cool jenny did a great job on them were they fun making jenny they were very fun and thank you very much i think they came out very good yeah they get really good they're very high quality shirts jenny and i wear shirt uh, our own shirts at, at certain times when we're trying to put a spotlight on ourselves and you can put a spotlight on yourselves if you go ahead and pick up one of these shirts today, you guys are going to love them. Link's in the description, www.zazzle.com at 13 o'clock. Yeah, so go check out our store at www.zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. We got these four cool new t-shirt designs plus all our old ones if you'd rather get one of the old ones. But these ones are awesome and you should check them out. They're also available in women's cut and they look really cute. jenny has got some. So thank you. Go check them out. Okay, and we're back. We're back. Yeah. Now we are talking about yet another historical serial killer. And we had to go get new drinks. We had to get. Well, you did. I had to. I still. I, I still had mine. This had is. Go. What is this again? This is vodka. It's and vodka with uh, cherry and passion fruit. Yeah, juice. Cherry, and yeah. mine's a uh, mojito. Yeah, you had to make a mojito. We're out of juice. Got to go to the store and get some more. <laughs> yeah. Some people have asked us to identify the cocktails. That yeah, we're yeah. Drinking what are you guys drinking? Because they'll drink the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's kind of cool though we should it like i said if we knew more cocktail recipes we could do like a theme for each yeah. one but it's like you know that would that would necessitate like buying tons of different well i recipes. gave out the recipe to my favorite drink on uh, on tom shady's movies oh you did okay. yeah it's called a kugel con yeah or a cool cool con all right <laughs> That's what he it's named yeah it. one part um pineapple juice yes one part um oh what's the name of it See, i've been drinking already not one okay one part pineapple <laughs> what's that other drink what's that other juice guava guava there you go yeah uh in some countries it's called goyaba all right so one part pineapple one part guava one part tequila of your choice over ice and that is a cool, cool con. Yeah. And boy, they'll fucking enough. put a hurting on you. They're good though. Yeah, he's yeah. just he's gonna just start talking nonsense. <laughs> I'm, just talking nonsense. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a purely American usually. drink. <laughs> purely American, Central American, South America. That's a, a new world drink for you guys over there in you, in Europe. You guys can hook that up. All right. <laughs> Make that on your own. You might have to add a little bit of simple syrup. Maybe a little bit of lemon to get the sweet and sour right, depending on the source of the juice. You do it to taste. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, mine's easy. Mine's just one part vodka, two parts cherry and passion fruit juice. Yeah, from Welch's. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. Welch's has a juice yeah. mix. And it's delicious, actually. Yeah. It doesn't even taste like there's alcohol in it, but oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right. So now we're doing, we're covering a topic which I've been wanting to do a long time because I'm super fascinated by female serial killers because like I said there's not that many many, and they do tend to have different motivations as this woman does as well now this woman is I guess she's kind of well known but not as well known as you would think because like I said she has uh, quite a high body count Uh, by some estimates anywhere between 25 and 40 victims they're not entirely sure Um, I I feel like and I'm gonna say this right like right at the outset female serial killers in general not all of them obviously um, female serial killers tend to kill in a more practical manner, for practical reasons, as this woman did. They don't get all fancy. Yeah, well, they don't seem to, I'm not saying they don't enjoy it, but they don't seem to sexually get off on it. They just yeah. seem to do it as a means to an end. Yeah. They're like, this person's just in the way, so I'm just going to bump them off. A lot of the, a lot of the male ones are doing it kind of like to magnify their power. Make yeah. Make other people suffer. Right, like I said, I, I feel like women are usually doing it for either financial reasons or to get rid of someone who's kind of un- get in their way or whatever. Or, you know, like I said, for practical reasons or to feed some kind of weird emotional, yeah. you know, because, you know, you have those nurses that, like, poison all those people so they can feel like they're saving Munchausen people. Yeah, proxy. like that kind of thing. So it seems like those are the main uh, things. Now, Bell Gunnis, otherwise known as Hell's Bell. <laughs> or, Hell's Bell! Or the Lady Bluebeard. <laughs> You She's also known some, as that, too. You gotta put in some ACDC in there with <laughs> the Hell's Bells. That's so hilarious. She was actually originally, she was born in Norway. Uh, uh, her son, she was, like, born on a farm there. And her father was a stonemason. Now, evidently, I'm not sure. They think she was born around 1859. Not entirely sure. But there is a story. I'm not sure if this is true or not. Um, I don't know if someone just invented this, like, to kind of justify, like her crimes later on or like explain them not justify them but explain them there's a story that in her uh early years i guess in her like late teenage years evidently she was still in norway this was prior to her uh coming to the united states she went to a country dance in the town where she was from and she was pregnant while she was at this dance this man kicked her in the stomach and made her have a miscarriage damn and because the guy was wealthy and she was poor, he kind of got away with it. Huh. Now, the story goes that that kind of gave her a lifelong hatred of men. Um, so Man, did that really happen? I that's, don't know. That it's, sounds like a legend. It's unverified, but several of her biographers have repeated this story. So I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, that's how the story goes. It just that sounds someone, like a legend. Doing you yeah, it might be, like I said. Yeah. The, somebody trying to explain like why yeah. she did what she did later on. So the interesting thing, too, and that's actually not the end of the story, but apparently the guy that kicked her in the stomach, not long after this happened, mysteriously died of stomach cancer yeah. very young. Okay. And some people think that she poisoned his ass. <laughs> so like I said, yeah. not real sure about that. Just this. off the top of my head, man, I'm going to say that's a legend. It probably okay. is. Okay, it just, I'm just sounds saying that too much like, that's a, something that gets like repeated an American legend that the early pulp 
you know, early pulp newspapers would have made up. Yeah. But, you know, okay, let's roll with that. Yeah. Let's roll with Like it. I said, it could have happened. I'm not Could really have sure. happened, but... It's not confirmed, but it's something that comes up I'm in a lot suspect. of her biographies. I'm suspect. So, at any rate, now, her, one of her sisters, uh, named Nellie Larson, had already emigrated to the United States uh, a little while before. So, in 1881, uh, Belle Gunnis, who was actually... She was born, and I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Sorry, people from Norway. <laughs> She was actually born Brunhilde Paul's daughter Storset. That was her birth name. But when she went to the United States in 1881, she decided to take a more Americanized kind of name. Uh, she actually first, when she got there, she worked as a servant for a little while. She arrived in 1881 and worked as a servant for about three years. Then she meets this guy named Mads Sorensen in Chicago. And they got married. And then they opened up like a candy store. Now, evidently, the candy store, even from the beginning, was not financially doing very well. So it was only open for about a year, and then it mysteriously burned down. You know how that goes. Those insurance wires got Exactly. I would, that's what I was waiting yeah. for you to say. Even in the pre-electrical <laughs> era. Yeah, <laughs> the electrical wires. Yeah. This time it was those like the gas fire wires. I don't know yeah, what they would those, call that. <laughs> those, those, those insurance gas pipes got crossed. Yes, that's probably yeah. exactly what happened. Yeah. So with the proceeds from the insurance, they actually bought a house. Now, there has been some debate over whether her and Mads had any children um, most research say they did that they had four. Uh, they were named Caroline, Axel, Myrtle, and Lucy. Now, Caroline and Axel both died in infancy from what they termed back then acute colitis. Damn. Which. That means shitting your brains out. Pretty much. It, yeah. yeah, it's diarrhea, nausea, that type of stuff. Yeah. Now, some people have pointed out in light of Bell's later activities that she may have poisoned these two children because the yeah. symptoms of colitis are very similar to like strychnine poisoning, arsenic poisoning, that type of stuff. So the two children died in infancy. Yeah. And the, it's funny that two of them came down with colitis. Yeah. That does seem a little yeah. suspicious, doesn't it? Yeah. You, yeah. Right. So, and another thing uh, pointing to her involvement was that both of these kids who were babies, essentially both had life insurance policies. Out yeah. On them, sounds like she's kind of, which kind of, yeah. Why would you rid- insure a baby? Hmm. She, I wonder why. Sounds like she's trying to get rid of her financial liabilities and they make a few bucks. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Yeah. So those two babies very, died now. Very, very late term abortion. Again. Yeah. Yeah. So the insurance companies paid out on those too. Now, okay. So then there was uh, in the 1900 census, um, Bell Gunnis comes up on the census records and at that point, it shows that two of her children were deceased um, and that two of them, Myrtle, was still alive. She was three. And then she had one named Lucy, who was one. At this stage, this is 1900. Also, there is a 10-year-old girl, apparently an adopted daughter, living in the house with Belle and Mad Sorensen. This girl is alternately known as either Morgan Couch or Jenny Olson. She's more commonly known as Jenny Olson. So she was apparently an adopted daughter. She was living with them in 1900. Now, later on that year, Mad Sorensen also turned up dead. Hmm. Interestingly, the same day on which two life insurance policies on him overlapped. How he died was apparently... um, Now, the interesting thing about his death, the first doctor that saw him, like that came to attend the, the death was like, bitches, that's strychnine poisoning, right? <laughs> However, Mad Sorensen had been uh, under undergoing treatment for uh, a heart condition. I think he had an enlarged heart or something like that. So another doctor said, no, it was just like a heart attack. He had some kind of, you know, he had some kind of heart condition and that's what killed him. So I guess the second doctor's opinion overrode the first one. So they didn't do an autopsy because they thought, oh, not suspicious at all. Of course not. Of course it wasn't suspicious. And Belle Gunnis even told the doctors that she's like, yeah, I've been giving him these like medicines that I make like to make him feel better for his heart condition, you know? <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So apparently everyone bought that. Right. The day after Mad Sorensen was buried, the day after his funeral, she walks in and collects her insurance payment. Now, there was actually um, 
an inquest ordered into his death pr after that because they're like, okay, well, maybe it was suspicious after all. But I don't know if they ever did anything about it. They did order an inquest, but I don't know if it ever took place. Like, no records of it survived. There are records that say, yes, they ordered an inquest, but there's no records of the inquest itself. So they don't know if they ever went through with it. They don't know if they exhumed his body or anything like that. Now, she actually ended up from his death, exhuming she actually... His, exhuming what? his body back in those days wouldn't have helped them at all, though. But the no, forensic technology have. that they had, I, I see why they didn't... They didn't bother with they it. They couldn't tell who was poisoned and who yeah. wasn't. So she ended up getting uh, about, in those, in those days money, which was 1900 uh, about $8,500, which in today's money would be over two hundred fifty grand. Yeah. So that's how much she Big ended score. up getting yeah, from, from Mad Sorensen's death. Enough to buy a house, easy. And that's exactly what she did. Right. In 1901, uh, she bought a big farm uh, in LaPorte, Indiana. Okay. And <laughs> reportedly, the boat and carriage houses on this farm burned down shortly after she bought the property. Sure. Cha -ching. <laughs> Cha -ching. She just got, again, like the heartburn. She's a she, serial scammer. She can't help herself. Serial scammer. She can't help herself. What are the what is the likelihood of all this happening to the same woman in the same lifetime? That's what I mean. It's just it's yeah. not likely. She's not scammer. likely at all. Yeah. Well, yeah, obviously. Scamming. So now before she moved to the farm in Indiana, uh, she kind of got back together with this guy she knew whose wife had just died, and his name was Peter Gunnis. Now he was also originally from Norway. Um, they got married in nineteen oh two. One week after they got married, Peter Gunnis's infant daughter died. Okay. <laughs> Interestingly, Damn. it's not funny. It's a baby. Yeah. She was the baby was in the house alone with Belle. Yeah, she so, killed it. Yeah, you know how that goes. How, how did it? What was the cause of death? I don't know actually. On they that didn't one. say. Uh, okay. It said it says uncertain causes, so it was like unknown. She choked that baby out or something. Yeah. Her, her thing was mostly uh, poisoning or sometimes bludgeoning, depending. Yeah, but you couldn't poison a baby in one day. True. Yeah, I don't know what she did. She might have smothered it. Yeah, she smothered it. Seems like that's probably the easiest right. uh, easiest thing to do. And doesn't I mean, she leave. She said it was something like crib death or... Yeah, that it doesn't... If they had that back then, I don't know if they did, if they knew what crib death was. They um, may have had another excuse that they could have used. You know, yeah. Right? They just, well, babies died. Well, they did right, back yeah. then. That's why, like, that's, that's why they couldn't prove shit. She died of consumption. Some yeah. weird shit like that. Yeah, or one of those weird... Or dropsy or whatever. Dropsy, One of those yeah. weird... One of those weird diseases they had back then. Yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, that was in April of 1902. Now in December of 1902, Peter Gunnis, the husband, also died in a yeah. quote unquote tragic accident. Now listen to this story. This is the tragic accident yes. story. Okay. Bell says that Peter Gunnis was in the house and that his slippers were next to the stove in the kitchen, and he was reaching for them. And then there was like a pot of brine that was like boiling on the, and it tipped over and burned him. And then, and that made like part of this big sausage grinding machine that they had up on a shelf above the stove fall down and hit him in the head and crush his skull. No, she crushed his ass with that damn machine, that damn sausage grinder. No shit. But then yeah. threw some hot water on him. That's what she said happened. Yeah. Now, even then... It seemed like like people around town were like, you know, Peter Gunnis. Yeah, that bitch there. She, he was a butcher. Right yeah. Um, he was very good at his job. Like they're like he was like pretty coordinated. That seems like a really improbable thing to happen. It was like super klutzy. That's like some shit I would do. Seriously. She, you, she, yeah, she's all thumbs. I know. I can't help yeah. it. It's it's genetic. But it's in her mind. It's not genetic. It's because she worries about it. Well, yeah, it's uh, yeah, you put yourself know. in the spotlight. But yeah, <laughs> like I don't, I don't mind. I know it's. I, <laughs> I'm a dork. I'm a klutz. I can't help it. I'm gonna get her out of it. But um, yeah. So that so even then, like some people that knew him and stuff like that were like, really, that sounds, that doesn't sound like something that would happen. It's like he's really not that klutzy. But you know, at any rate, no one really. That's a story a dame would make up. That. <laughs> <laughs> it does even like like I said, if you're gonna kill if you're gonna bump off your husband for the insurance money, I mean at least make it look like something that could like Like a it, manly death. Like <laughs> <laughs> He was trying you know what I mean? Yeah, he was trying to like, you know, barbecue some shit and he like it fucking I don't he know. He fell down in a well. That kind of stuff. <laughs> make it sound like something a little has, more the CIA has said over and over and over again. The most plausible way to commit homicide is to push somebody out a window. 
See, that's what I always thought too. Like, j- yeah. make it look like like because they can't prove that. It's hard to prove. Hard to unless somebody prove. sees it, and even yeah. then, you could still argue with you it. Push somebody out of yeah, window. Because they could have just. They could have just. Building. Yeah, they could have just jumped. They don't yeah. know. So yeah, there's no way to prove it. So you know, pro tip. <laughs> just seriously. <coughs> We're not that. teaching you people how to kill them, <laughs> how to get away. There's cameras today. It's not like it was back then. Yeah. Yeah. For all you know, you throw a motherfucker out a window and across the street, there's a camera pointed at you. There probably is these they days. They see your smiling ass fucking face <laughs> throwing some dude out the front window <laughs> thinking you're going to go cha-ching. No, I wouldn't go. There's cameras to now. They just have pictures there's of you. There's cameras going. now. It's not the same. <laughs> Holy shit, that's funny. Okay. So, Peter Gunness is dead in this wildly improbable manner. Uh, but apparently the insurance company doesn't think that's weird enough to not pay because they do. Uh, she got about $3,000 in back then money, which is a, over $100,000 in today money. Um, so like I said, a lot of the locals were just like, yeah, no, I don't think so. Now, the coroner did actually come forward and say, I think he got murdered. Uh, we need another jury. We need to convene. We need to do an inquest and all this other stuff. So there was some suspicion thrown on her. And there was also allegedly the uh, the adopted daughter, Jenny Olson, who at this point was 14, um, allegedly she told a classmate and was overheard to say, my mama killed my papa. Don't tell anyone I told oh, you. Oh shit. Now, so like, I don't know if that's true or not, but allegedly someone overheard her saying that to a friend of hers. It's so hearsay, hearsay. Yeah. So they brought the kid before, um, the coroner's jury, but the kid said, no, I never said that. Okay. So I don't know if she thought she, her ass was going to get killed too. Yeah. Maybe her mama straightened that out real quick. But yeah. Um, so it happened that Belle Gunness at this point, she was actually brought before the coroner's jury. Um, but she kind of pleaded her and she's like, no, it was just an accident and all this other stuff. Now she was pregnant at this point, but she didn't tell anybody that. Um, they're not sure why, because they said if she, you know, she'd said she was pregnant, she probably would have got more sympathy, but it didn't matter. And in, in the end, it didn't matter because they still, they didn't, they couldn't prove it. So, uh, she actually got off with it that time too. Now, in 1903, she gave birth to a little boy named Philip. And then the next thing that happened was, this was in 1906. Nobody had seen Jenny Olson, the adopted daughter, around for quite a while. So people started asking about it. Belle's like, oh, she went away to Los Angeles to this Lutheran college. She told some of the neighbors that. She told other neighbors that she went off to some finishing school somewhere else. You can probably imagine where that little girl ended up. We will find out later on. (laughs) She was not in either one of those places. So between 1903 and 1906, from the time that she had the baby boy, Philip, to the time that Jenny Olson disappeared, um, about 1907, then she she gave a job to this guy named Ray Lamphere. Uh, He was her farmhand. Now, around the time that Ray started working on her farm, She also started, she decided to expand her horizon. So what she started to do, I guess back in the day, uh, you could run, there was in the newspapers, they had a matrimonial column and ladies of means could run advertisements in there saying, hey, I want some guy with money to come out and we'll join our fortunes. Cha-ching. Exactly. She's going to kill another one. This is the Black Widow. Yeah. This, yeah, they do the Black Widow, the Lonely Hearts Killer. That's what this woman is, right. Yes, Exactly. So one of the ads she ran, she ran them in several newspapers. Her ad said, personal, comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in LaPorte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow answer with personal visit. Triflers need not apply. Yeah, you triflers. No trifling motherfuckers. <laughs> Seriously. Now, I have to say at this point, Bell Gunnis, there were a lot of responses. This was just like now, there's a lot of desperate dudes out there, I guess. Bell Gunnis, uh, when she was young, I don't think I would call her a pretty woman. She was a handsome woman. She was also a big, strapping woman. She was six feet tall. Yeah, and this is before they had the term big fine. Okay, they yeah. didn't have big fine back then. Uh, uh, she was six feet tall, about two hundred pounds. What they call a plow pulling woman. Yes. Good, good old good good German Germanic. Yes. Germanic 
working woman. And by all accounts... <laughs> Got the childbearing was, hips and shit. Yeah, she was a big, she had big, broad shoulders, big Whip woman. your ass, you get out of line. Yeah, and yeah. by all accounts, she was easily as strong as a man, if yeah. not stronger. Because a lot of her, like, farmhands and stuff like that, they said they would bring her, like, so these heavy trunks. Woman, she she would pick them right up, put them on her shoulders, and yeah. carry them like they didn't weigh anything. Yeah. Right? So she was, like, a very, very one physically them, imposing, very, very strong Oregon woman. trail chicks. Yeah, she yeah. was a big, big woman. So she runs this personal ad. Now, they get, she gets like a whole bunch of uh, responses. Now, <laughs> one of the first ones she got was this guy named John Moe. He came from Minnesota. Now, he brought $1,000 with him in old-timey money. And he brought it so he could pay off her mortgage. So he could pay, he could prove like how much money. It's so like, see, I'm yeah. wealthy. I have all I'm this money. I'm not trifling. Yeah, he's not trifling. <laughs> not, not, not one bit. <laughs> Now, the first red flag that should have made him run away, but did not, was that Belle Gunnis introduces him to the seven neighbors and doesn't say, oh, this is a guy I'm going to marry, or this is, you know, one of my non-trifling <laughs> personal ad answerers. She said that he was her cousin. Hmm. So, hmm, that seemed a little weird. But he didn't apparently think so. So, uh, he was only at the farm for a few days and then vanished off the face of the earth. Damn. Then there was another guy named George. So they didn't even find his body. Uh, we'll see. She okay. She just took his thousand dollars and knocked his ass off, didn't she? Yeah. That's okay. okay. What she did. Right. <laughs> many, many, many times. <laughs> She's, when you think about it, kind of dumb. I mean that that that's two dimensional thinking when you think about it. Although she got away for, with it for a long time, you have to admit. Well, she's playing other people for fools. Yeah. But maybe they were back then. Well, they must have been. They must have been for you to rack up that kind of body count before anybody said, hey, wait a minute, lady. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. It's we like know what you're before doing. Before everybody here. gets together and is like, hey, right. where I was going to go answer Why that. Why are all these motherfuckers Norwegian ladies around around too? Yeah. And then no one ever came back. Yeah. Because <laughs> hardly anybody did. It was a different time. It was. It was a different well, time. Well, if people came from different states, like I said, you wouldn't, yeah. and, you know, if, if the guy was like going to answer a personal ad, he wouldn't necessarily say where he was going or what, right. name, what her name was or anything like that. So the next guy was named George Anderson. Uh, he was from Missouri, and uh, he was also a Norwegian immigrant. Now, he, uh, he came to the farm, and they were having dinner, and Belle said that. Um, he, he said that he would pay her mortgage off, like to prove, just like the other guy had, uh, if she agreed to marry him. So she lets him stay over at the farm. Now, the story goes that he woke up in the middle of the night and saw Belle Gunnis standing over him, hmm. like with a candle in her face. She looked like all, she was just like a fucking horror movie, right? Yeah. Now, this tipped him off. Thinking about how she was going to knock that ass right. off. Yeah. This tipped him off. Now he flipped out, so she ran yeah. out of the room. Now he now the next day he skedaddled, right? So he is the only person that they know of that answered her ad that survived. Yeah, dude dude was smart. Yeah, he's he like, was like, I'm up out of here. <laughs> because apparently the face she was making at him like yeah. terrified him so much that he's just like <laughs> that he left skid marks <laughs> on the way out. Cause she like I said, this was a big woman. <laughs> And she was very, um, like I said, she was she was a handsome woman, but I could see how that would be very scary seeing this big, huge woman like lurking. Yeah, and this is a this is a time when the average man probably weighed about 140 pounds too. Because she seemed like she just carried him around, yeah. like and just flung him around like they dolls, yeah, man. And I don't think guys were most guys were not very big, especially according to the clothes and the yeah. specification they were given. They were weedy little fuckers. They didn't have the nutrition or the physical fitness. So. Yeah. If a woman had genetically big bones, she'd probably whip your ass back then. Yeah, and like I guys, said, I'm sure she did because yeah. she, she killed a shit ton of people. Yeah. <laughs> she killed a shit ton of people. And like yeah. I said, her, um, according to many people that worked on her farm, you know, uh, at this stage, she starts ordering these big trunks, like from yeah. shops in town. And so the guy that dro like, drove the thing that brought them, he said Belle would come out to the you know, to the carriage, she would just pull the trunk off the carriage, sling it up on her shoulders. And just, he said it carried it. She said, he said that, um, she said it, it looked like it just weighed nothing like a marshmallow. Yeah. It's like, it, like it weighed nothing. Now there were also reports from this time that many neighbors reported that she was often seen in the middle of the night digging in her hog pen. So hmm, hmm. that seems a little suspicious, but no one thought anything of it at the time. Good place to hide bodies. 
Nobody wants to dig up a fucking it hog was. pan. <laughs> like yeah. I said, they didn't punish it until much later. Okay. The next guy uh, was an older guy. He was a widower. Uh, his name was Ole Budsberg, and he was from Wisconsin. Um, the last time anybody saw his ass was at the Laporte Savings Bank in April of 19. Withdrawing that money. Withdrawing. Yeah. Uh, several thousand dollars and signing over a deed. I saw that coming. Uh, yeah. So now at this, he had two sons. Now they didn't know that that's where the father had gone. But when they finally figured it out later on, they, they wrote to her and were like, hey, did my dad come like an answer with your dad? She's like, no, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. I don't know she wrote back and she's like, mm -hmm. I, know, I never saw him. So then over the next few months, uh, several more men replied to her ad and never returned home. Uh, there was a guy in December of 1907 whose name was Andrew Helgeline, and he was from South Dakota. And he wrote her a letter, and um, they they actually have a lot of the letters still survive that they wrote back and forth to each other. Now, listen to this shit. This is a letter that Belle wrote to him uh, in January of 1908. Listen to how she how thick she lays this shit on, man. Oh, it's going to be, I love you, by the way. Bring me your money, and we'll join she our She actually empires. doesn't say Well, she didn't say that okay. exactly. Okay. She says, to the dearest friend in the world, no woman in the world is happier than I am. I know that you are now to come to me and be my own. I can tell from your letters that you are the man I want. It does not take it does not take one long to tell when to like a person, and you I like better than anyone in the world I know. Oh, a guy wants to hear this shit. Think how we will enjoy each other's company. You, oh. the sweetest man in the whole world. We will be all alone with each other. Can you oh. conceive of anything nicer? Oh, God. I think of you constantly. When I hear your name mentioned, and this is when one of the dear children speaks of you, or I hear myself humming it with the words of an old love song, it is beautiful <laughs> music to my ears. My heart beats in wild rapture for you, my Andrew. I love you. Come prepared to stay forever. Oh, shit. That's like some shit from the fucking Disney haunted house. Isn't that creepy? Yeah. Oh, like that last sentence. It's like yeah. I read that and like all the hair stood up on my yeah. arms. Come prepared to stay to forever. To stay forever. <laughs> and then the fucking ghost with that, that chick with echo, the axe. Echo, echo, yeah. The little axe that fucking Forever. Yeah, forever and ever. Come play with us, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. That's what I thought of. So yeah. creepy. And she's telling that dude what he wanted to hear. And yeah. Everything. Like, and apparently oh, me and you together alone forever. You're the night. Oh, shit. He's thinking about getting laid. She's thinking about killing your ass. Yeah. She's like, wow. God damn. It worked. He came. Yeah. To, he came. Uh, no mention of bring me your money, though. No. I, okay. Maybe Must that, have been that, in other letters. That, that was, was other implied. letters. Yeah, because yeah. they exchanged. Oh, by the way, go down to the bank real quick. Yeah, I'll go to shit. the bank with you. So yeah, give me yeah. your ATM card and your PIN number. <laughs> yeah. Before they had that. Withdraw that shit, put it in my account, we'll have a joint account. Yeah. That's what she was because doing. Because when he came uh, after that letter, because like I said, he was just like, oh, this is, this is a woman for me. I'm going. So he turns up yeah. there, uh, you know, later that month. With him, he has a check for $2,900, which is all his savings. He had taken all of his savings out of his bank. Um, and then they, he, so he gets there. Now, a few days after he got there, he was seen alive again at the bank. Gunnis was with him and they were in LaPorte, Indiana. They deposited his check. A couple days after that, he disappeared. Poof. <laughs> wonder where Poof. he went. I wonder where he went. Went yeah. underneath that pig stock. Buried underneath that pig pen. That's where he was. Yeah, so I figured. But yeah, so Bell Gunnis turns up at the bank a couple more times, putting in little deposits. $500 here, $700 there. Now, at this stage... Now, isn't the, aren't the people at the bank getting kind of curious what the fuck's going on? Evidently not. Maybe they kind of have, a, they kind of have this uh, code don't of honor. Don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, where, they, <laughs> where they're like, well, this money is entering our bank, okay? It's not on us. To figure out where is all this, you know, where this is coming from. It's just bank money. Yeah. And I feel like they might be less likely to question a woman also. Maybe. I, I would think that they would know that, hey, this these guys are depositing all this money in this woman's account. And we're never seeing these guys again. Yeah. Although maybe, I don't know, maybe they just didn't notice. I don't oh, know, how, no, big, no, I don't no, know no. how big this town was. Those tellers would know. I well, think what, what, what I think what it was is that the... Bank manager, bank or owners they like the money too much. Yeah, the bank bank owners like, well, hey, like, that's a thousand dollars, man. Yeah, it's like shut up. 
Let, let it ride. Yeah. It's that's not like on we, us. We don't want to stop that money train. Yeah, that's not our, that's not our, we're not in that line of work. Right. That's law enforcement. All right. That's probably exactly what they said. Yeah. yeah. It's like, hey, it's not our, it's not our it's job. It's not our job. It's above our pay Don't wonder what the hell's going on. Yeah. So around this time, uh, she's been starting to have problems with her little farmhand, Ray Lamphere. Now, apparently, and this is bizarre, Ray Lamphere apparently has fallen madly in love with Balgunas during this time. And he's starting to get really annoyed at all these other dudes showing up. Now, as far as I know, Ray Lamphere knew that she was killing all these dudes because he would help. I don't think he helped killing anybody, but he did help <coughs> burying them and like getting rid of the bodies and stuff like that. So she had a hired I'm man. I'm pretty sure. But he's starting to get really bothered by like all these other dudes showing up because he's apparently in love with her. So he's starting so to. So she's the real boy. He's the real boyfriend. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if she was like involved. How with much him. you want to bet? Maybe. How much you want to bet? There's an arrangement. He's the real boyfriend. Yeah, it might have been. So he's starting to get annoyed. He's like, I don't like all these other men coming around, and I don't like this, and blah blah blah. So Belle is just kind of like, okay, well, uh, you're going to be a problem for me. So actually, she just uh, fired him. Hmm. So. <clears throat> So Maybe this, he just thought he was the real boyfriend. Right. So, he yeah, so he started, like, making scenes and stuff. So she got rid of him in uh, February of 1908. Now, then, to cover her own ass, she immediately, like, the day after she fired him, she shows up at the courthouse, and she goes, um, I'm having all these problems with my former uh, farmhand. He's, yeah. like, harassing me. He's threatening to kill my family and burn my farm down. Um, and he keeps coming around and it's like, can you guys, you know, do something about it or whatever. He's a loose end. She's going to get rid of him. Right. So she's like, he's a menace to society, she told yeah. them. <laughs> so they actually believed her and they held a sanity hearing. Um, but they found that he was sane and fine and they let him go. So then a couple days after that, Belgunas comes back um, to tell the sheriff that, oh, that Ray guy, he's been around here and he's arguing and I can't get rid of him and you need to do something about it because he's threatening my family and all this other stuff. And he got arrested for trespassing. So evidently, even after he kept getting out of jail, he kept coming back. Like, so apparently he really didn't love her for whatever reason because he could have probably just told the authorities, I would escape. hey, she's a murderer. Right. Um, but he never seemed to do that. And um, he didn't leave. No, he didn't leave. He kept coming back. Um, now, he did kind of make some threats toward her. He did allegedly tell another farmer uh, or implied that they had killed uh, Andrew Helgelein. So, at, at Who this, knows the situation, though? Maybe she told him a different story. That's what I mean. I'm not like, entirely sure how complicit he was. I was going to marry that guy, and then he did this and that to me, and I had to kill him in self-defense. It might have been that. And it might have been, oh, he turned up, and he was a shithead just like right, all the yeah. other ones. Do something about that. Right. You know, who knows? Yeah. But so... It was a different time. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, like I said, she did yeah. really seem to be able to persuade him to do any stuff. I don't know if he... I don't think he killed any of the people. I think she did all of that. Um, but he may have helped her get rid of the bodies. But like you said, she might have given her given him like some kind of line about right. you know, they tried to take it? my money or they tried to rape they, me yeah, or they tried or something like that. like that. It's like who knows? He was a bad man. Yeah. That kind of deal. So at this stage, now Andrew Helgelein had been missing for quite a while. Now he had a brother. Um and he the brother was actually like okay and then the brother knew where Andrew Helgelein had gone. So he writes to Bell Gunness and he's like, uh where's my brother? He was coming out to see you. And she says, yeah, he came here, but he left. Maybe he went back to Norway to visit family. You know, how the hell would I know? I don't know where he went. So then the brother writes back and he's like, I do not believe you. Um, I don't think he would get to Norway without telling us where he was going. Um, I think he's still there. And uh, that, because that's the last place that we heard from him. So Bell Gunnis drops her nuts and says, okay, Bell come Gunnis on out. Nuts? Bell Gunnis had nuts. Well, metaphorical, oh, nuts. metaphorical She dropped her metaphorical nuts. Okay. And she basically says to the brother, come on out here and search for him. But guess what? Searching for a missing person around the farm, that's going to cost you. Because it costs a lot of money to look for a missing person. So bring some money out here and I'll let you look for him. <laughs> that's basically that's what she said. So he actually did uh, come out to look for the brother. Now, at this stage... 
um, she has told like everybody about this Ray Lanfear guy, her former, uh, her former uh, farmhand. She told the lawyer. She told the sheriff. She told so, so everybody. She's like setting this up to make him the fall guy. Essentially, I think is what she was doing. Because she said, oh, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill my children, whatever. Um, and she specifically said he's going to kill us and burn the farm down. She told several people that, including her lawyer. So she said, I want to make out a will in case he really does it. So her lawyer uh, drew up a will. She made it out and everything like that. She left the entire estate to her kids. Then she leaves the lawyer's offices. Then she goes to her bank. And evidently, she takes out most of her money. <laughs> Again, no one thought that was strange. Now, in the, at this point, she had hired another farmhand. His name was Joe Maxson, uh, after Ray Lamphere had left. In April, late April of 1908, he's been living in the house. He wakes up, and the house is on fire. <laughs> and he... <laughs> the insurance wire's crossed again. Mm. Yeah. So, he smells smoke in his room. He opens the door of his room, and it's just it's just flames so he's just in his underwear he jumps out the fucking second floor window and just barely escapes with his life i mean the whole house is just like it's fucking torched that's been a pretty big house uh it, yeah floors. it was it's you know there's nothing left of it now obviously because right, yeah. it burned to the ground um it was it was a big plot of land but yeah so he goes out he goes to the town and get help but by the time you know the fire marshals get there there's, there's just nothing left now interestingly in the ruins of Belgunis's farm, they find four bodies. Three of them are children. She had three surviving children, and they're assuming that that's who those three bodies were. They were her little kids. They also found the body of a woman, which at first they assumed was Belgunis, but they couldn't tell because the body didn't have a head, and they never did find it. Huh. Also, the coroner was kind of like, and all the neighbors were kind of like, I don't think that's Belgunis because the coroner said... This body is a female body, but this woman was probably only about five foot three and couldn't have weighed any more than 150 pounds. As I said, Bill Gunnis was at least six feet tall and weighed at least 200 pounds. She was a very, very large woman. So a lot of people said this could not be her skeleton. Were and like there I any said, missing women? Um, yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so there was kind of, and then the um, her dentist comes forward and says, well, uh, we can't find the head, but if you can find, I did a bunch of dental work on her that I would recognize. So if you can find the teeth, uh, cause I think she wore like a partial plate or like some kind of crown or something like that. It wasn't entirely clear that like, if you can find that in the ruins, then maybe I can make a positive identification. Um, coincidentally, somebody found, uh, a set of teeth in the ruins. They never did find a head, but they found a set of teeth and the dentist was like, yeah, that's totally Bell Gunness's teeth. So that must be who that is. Except nobody buys it. Because they're like, there's no way that could have been her. Because they're like, this was a small woman. So, but because the dentist identified the teeth. How did she take teeth, her teeth out, though? Because they came out. It was like dentures. Oh, okay. Like dentures. Yeah. She threw her dentures in there. Yeah. yeah. So, like I said, there was controversy. But since the dentist said it, they were like, okay, well, I guess that was Belle and her three kids. And they burned to death. And Ray Lamphere must have burned the house down just like she said that he was going to. Now, a fire can totally destroy bone but it would have to be really hot it had they did think of that at the time for a long time but they're sitting there saying weirdly yeah it's like Weird, yeah it could have burned the, the fat off itself, but the rest of the bodies yeah, looked right. like they would have looked they were the size and okay. shape of the children that okay. they thought that they were so they just thought it was very and they thought it was strange because they're like where's the head you know they found all the other heads it's like why did we just find no head on this body right. that seems a little weird so they actually, um, so they went to arrest Lay Lam Ray Lanfear because she had told them, hey, he said he was going to burn my house down. And lo and behold, the house burned down. So they well, arrested. she said that because she was going to burn exactly, the house down. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's what I said. She was setting it up. Yeah. So he gets arrested. Now, he really didn't uh, help his case all that much. Uh, they said, hey, the house burned down. And he said, um, oh, did they get out okay? Did Bell Gunnis and the kids get out okay? Um, even before they really said what had happened. And then he's like, no, no, that wasn't me. But then another guy, like a neighbor, said that he had seen Ray Lamphere running away from the site. Right? So, and he was apparently pretty credible. He could have been paid off. It could have been. 
but we'll I'll get to that like how this could have right. been uh, how this could have been happening. Okay. Okay. So Raylan Fear is arrested for arson and murder. Okay, on the word of this person, and like I said, the threats beforehand. Now, at this stage, um, the brother of Andrew Helgelein, whose name was Asley Helgelein, he shows up in town and he says, look, I think that Belgon has killed my brother. So then Joe Maxson, who was the hired hand that Bell had hired after she fired Ray Lamphere, he comes forward and he says, yeah, you know, um, she asked me to bring like all these wheelbarrows of dirt and fill in all these mysterious depressions in the hog pen. She wanted all the uh, the hog pen. She wanted all the ground level, and uh, I thought that was a little funny. But you know, I'm I work there, so I did it anyway. So then the cops are like, um, maybe we should dig yeah. that up. So they start digging in the hog pen. First body they found, Jenny Olson, the huh. adopted daughter who was 14 years old. She had vanished on December 1906. She was the first one they found and that they identified. Then they found two more bodies that were very small children. Uh, they, I don't think those two were ever identified. They might have been hers, or they might have been somebody's that uh, she brought along with. Uh, somebody brought along with her. I want to say something them. real quick. That What's must that? have been well-fed hogs, because hogs can smell like it crazy. They got yeah. a good sense of smell. Well, if they got hungry, they'd have smelled those bodies there, there and dug them up um, and eat them. There are some sources that claim that some of the bodies, she did cut them up and feed them to the hogs. Okay, all right. So, um, yeah, because they don't know. There are more people missing that they think answered her ad than bodies right. that they've, although they did found, find a lot. Um, then they found the body of Andrew Helgeline. Uh, some reports say that his brother was actually the one that found the body. And they actually have a photograph of it. I'll put it in the video. It's pretty gross. But, yeah, they found uh, his body. Then they kept digging and they kept coming across more. Now, the ones that they identified, um, Ole Budsberg, who was one of the guys that answered her ad, uh, he disappeared in May of 1907. Uh, a guy named Thomas Linbo, who she had hired uh, to work on the farm, they found his body. Uh, there was another guy named Henry Gerholt, and hmm. uh, he was another one that had answered the ad, and he had uh, brought like $1,500 with him. They found a watch that they know belonged to him, so they knew it was him. Um, several other guys... Uh, that had answered the ad. They also found uh, his bodies. Mm. Then, like, they were asking around, like, as news got out uh, of all these bodies they were finding, um, they were getting people that reported, like, families that were like, hey, you know, our, you know, uncle, our dad, or whatever, like, went out there to meet that woman. So they found a bunch of other bodies that they're not sure who they are, but they think some of them, possible victims, might have been some other guys, like a guy named William Mingay, a guy named Herman Konitzer, um, you know, there's just several others. There's a huge, huge list. I think if you go to Wikipedia or if you, I don't, actually, I don't know if they have all the victims on Wikipedia. I found them somewhere else. Um, I might, have, might be on Murderpedia. That actually has a better, uh, a better write-up. But yeah, there's just tons and tons and tons of people. Um, and they also they found like rings and things belonging to people. So as I said, they're not sure entirely how many people, uh, she killed, uh, lowest estimate 25, highest estimate about 40 but it might have been more than that. Uh, they did find some things. And like I said, uh, Ray Lamphere said that she maybe had cut up some of the people and fed them to the hogs. So they don't really know. So Ray Lamphere stands trial in May of 1908 for the murder charge and the arson charge. There were, uh, at, at the trial, there were kind of um, allegations that the dentist who had you know, made the coroner say, yeah, that was Bell Gunness's body in the fire, that he had planted that denture, hmm. right? Or that he had been the one that found it or whatever. So there was some allegation that that happened. Um, now, also later on, because uh, Ray Lamphere, they, they actually did get him on the arson charge, but not on the murder charge. But he actually came forward later, and according to a reverend who he allegedly confessed to... He actually said what Bell Gunnis had done. It's like, one, he said, she's still alive. That wasn't her in the fire. She just took off and changed her name or whatever. Um, he says, I didn't murder anybody, but I did help her bury a lot of the victims. He said what she would do is like the guy would come with the money and everything and she would take him and they would deposit the money. She would then um, make him a big dinner. She would put, uh, she would either put um, like sleeping pills or she would put poison in the coffee. And then um, when the guy fell asleep, she would uh, bash in his head with hmm. like a cleaver is what she would do. 
Uh, sometimes they're like, also sometimes she would wait for the guy to go to bed and then would go in there and chloroform him. Um, they said that she was actually, like I said, she was a big strong woman. So she, a lot of times would just, they would chloroform them and she'd just sling them over her shoulder, take them out to the hog pen. She would, she would usually take them down and she would dissect them. Uh, she's like, he, uh, he was, she was very good at that because her, uh, Peter Gunnis had been a butcher right. and evidently taught her how to do that. So uh, she would cut she would cut the bodies and bury them in the hog pen, or she would feed them to the hogs. Dang. Um, they said sometimes she would put the bodies into the hog scalding vat uh, and cover them with quicklime. So as I said, they have no idea how many people she actually killed because he's like there was a lot. Um, I think I believe he said by his count it was forty two men. Damn. Um, but there may be more, and I don't think he was counting all the kids that she killed, because I right. think she killed a bunch of children, too, including uh, most of her own. Damn. Now, Total psychopath. Yeah. Now, Ray Lamphere also said, um, he said the woman that was found in the fire with no head, they said this woman um, was a woman that I don't know if he knew what her name was, but he said uh, Belle actually got her to come from Chicago uh, to work as a housekeeper, on her farm and this was only like a few days before she was planning on burning the place down and getting the fuck out of there so she was planning this she had this whole scheme worked out so that was her out so yeah she had somebody i mean you'd think she would have been smart enough to like find a body that was like her size but you know i guess beggars can't be choosers right so he's like this so this woman came thinking she had a job um at, at which point uh bell drugged her bashed her in the head and then cut her head off um, said took the head, uh, weighted it down, and threw it into a really deep swamp. And then she evidently chloroformed her own children, uh, smothered them, and then left them in their beds, then left the house on fire and got the fuck out of Dodge. Damn. Um, she said she did actually dress the uh, the body in her clothes. Uh, she took out her dentures and left them next to the thing so it would be identified as her, but she didn't want the head there. Uh, and then she got the hell out of there. Um, now over the ensuing years, now Ray Lamphere said by his account, like I said, that she had killed at least 42 men. She thinks that over the course of her career, let's call it, um, that she had made over a quarter million dollars in old timey money from all her, so, which is, hmm. uh, which is almost $7 million Damn. in today's money. So she cashed in, uh, yeah. she knew what she was doing and she got away with it. They never caught her. And how much of the money did she escape with? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Might have been all of that. Or Man. most, of, or a large portion of it. So, evidently, for many ensuing years... I guess crime did pay in that case. For her, it did. Yeah. Sadly enough. Although she narrowly escaped. Yeah. But she did escape. Yeah. They never found her. Now, evidently, she was uh, spotted uh, many times over the ensuing years. Some people claim they saw her in San Francisco. Some people said they saw her in Los Angeles. Some people said they saw her in New York. Um, in 1931, someone reported seeing her living in Mississippi. Yeah. Um, she apparently... Be a good place to run. Yeah. She um, actually owned like a great deal of land there and was kind of well-known, but she had changed her name. Um, so that was... So she was kind of thinking ahead. She didn't she have a was, long-term yeah. plan for, for the farm. The farm was the scene of the crime. Yeah. She was going to bring a bunch of guys there, murder them, steal their money, and then run from there. Honestly, uh, I don't think she would have done that if Ray Lamphere hadn't started acting up and she thought that he was going to make trouble for her. So I think when that shit started happening, like when he started making a scene and she thought, oh, he's going to narc on me... Then yeah. she thought, okay, maybe I need to get the fuck you out of here. You couldn't run that scam forever in that location. Exactly. You but were going to have to move. But maybe the fact of him doing that, like, just kind of speeded, speeded along, up, right. like, what she was going to do. I feel like. Because, I, you know, she had been doing it for years and years, and, and no one had really caught on. And every time you move, you're starting fresh with that big bundle of money. Yeah. So you're, you're clean. And that's evidently Back what she did. Back in those days, there was no way to trace you. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Now, interestingly, the same year that she was reported living in Mississippi... Um, in Los Angeles, that same year, 1931, a woman named Esther Carlson was arrested for poisoning a dude for money. Hmm. Now, a couple people who saw photographs of her in the paper swore that that was Belle Gunnis, but they could never prove that it now, actually was. Did they say exactly where in Mississippi? Uh, I don't think so. With that kind of money, you could have owned a significant part of yeah. Mississippi. 
at that time. Yeah, you probably could have. And uh, uh, reportedly she did. She had like a, a very large uh, thing. Mm. So evidently they buried this body uh, next to her first husband in an Illinois cemetery, the body that they found in the fire, which is probably not her. Now in 2007, they wanted to do a DNA analysis because they wanted to, to, to decide once and for all, was that really her? Um, they actually were trying to get DNA from some stuff that had been at the farm that had survived, like that they hoped would still have DNA on it, like, you know, letters that she had licked or whatever. Um, but they couldn't get enough DNA uh, to make a profile that to, they could match to the So they know, that they they know where the location of this farm is to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny because even after that happened, like I said, uh, Laporte, Indiana, I believe there's still like a big sign there and everything and people still go there. The, obviously the farm's gone, but... Um, even at the time, like after it happened, yeah. it became a huge tourist attraction. Okay. There's pictures of like people, there's like all these old timey cars, like alongside of the road, like to come hmm. see the murder farm. You know what I mean? You know they, what they were like back then. Yeah. They're still <laughs> like that now. I know, but I'm just like, it's <laughs> it's like you tend to yeah. think of people back then, oh, they were so, they had decorum and said, no, no. they didn't. They did the same kind of shit we do yeah. nowadays. It's like, let's go yeah. see where all these people got murdered. Same that was kind the of time shit. of fucking P.T. Barnum. Yeah, yeah, same kind of thing. So as I said, Things worked out kind of better for her. I mean, the Hart brothers, they both got their heads chopped off yeah. and, like, put up on fucking spikes and everything, being, like, you know, like I said, a warning to the others. Belle Gunness... Made it out of there. She got away with that shit. She Whoa. killed everybody. And they still never got away it. with it with all the money. And mm -hmm. evident. I mean, obviously she's dead now, but I don't think she ever got caught for that shit. Because I don't think that was her in the She fire. had enough money to change her name and start a new life. Then, and that's probably apparently what she did. Yeah. So, yeah, like you said, crime did pay in her yeah. case. But yeah, so Although I guess... I guarantee she had all kinds of mental fucking problems over doing that. Well, obviously. Well, you would hope. Killing her I mean, own kids even, you know. Yeah. But like I said, maybe bad. maybe she just had a thing like the harp. She was just like this practical kind of like... Might have been just a total sociopath, total psychopath. She must no, have been. No feelings towards other people. She just, must have been. Yeah. She was, like I said, she doesn't... And again, I'm not saying that female serial killers of this type... I'm not saying they don't enjoy the killing... I'm just saying that she didn't seem to like take a lot of pleasure, and it's just like she she usually just, just she poisoned them. Yeah, yeah, she just poisoned them or bashed them in the head and just cut them up and fed them to the hogs. Just you know what I mean? It wasn't like she was like getting off on it like a sexual. She was just getting them out of the way because she wanted their money and she didn't want. I'm sure there was a rush of power though. Probably getting all this money for nothing, basically. Yeah. Well, you know. Man, look at those big old birds walked by. Did they really? Oh my can, god. There's the huge sandhill huge cranes sand like right cranes. outside the window. These are four, five feet tall. They might knock in a minute. It's we like call a person it, walking by the window. We call them the dinosaur birds. If yeah. you feed them one time, which technically you're not really they supposed to. They never forget you. Because they know they're me. very loud. But, I fed um, them once. They he, know me. He fed them once. He gave them like some bread or some granola. And they all know me. They show up and, they, and then they want me to feed their children. Yeah, they show, yeah but they yeah. show up with their babies. They show up with their babies. Hey, feed them. You fed us one time, and actually, yeah. if you don't come out, because they have they have a very loud. If you're not from Florida, if you they knock on the Santa, window, they'll knock on your window or your door, and they know where you are. Yeah, I've had them come to like we have a door like right back here by behind yeah. my office, and I've had them come and like thump on the door with their beaks. They've yeah. knocked on our bedroom window with their beaks. Yeah. They know you're in there, and they'll pass their children forward and go feed them. Yeah, yeah it's, it's weird. the craziest it's thing. Weird. It's crazy. They're really weird birds. They're very they, smart. Yeah, they're yeah. and they're like as tall as me. Yeah, so they're like a little. They're a protected bird. Yeah. Legally, you're not supposed to feed them, but well, you're not. Yeah, like I said, because they're. I do what I want. They're kind of a nuisance. Just yeah, they're they're, they're, they're very noisy. Like yeah. their their call is very very noisy. And they will try to come in the house. They will, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're not. They they're do not, not scared give, of people. They walk right they up to you. They do not give a single fuck. Nope. They will walk right right in your house if you let them, and they yep. just be like, "Hey, you got anything in here?" Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll probably fucking peck you if you don't. Beat up your cats. Yeah, they'll do that. They're not too. scared of cats either. No, they're not scared of anything. No. Like I said, they look like fucking velociraptors or some shit. Yeah. All right, so let's wrap this up because it's been Rapid going up. on a really long time. This was yeah. kind of a fun show, though. I was like, it's a fun show. Holy crap! I can barely talk. <laughs> I and even we got to go out tonight. I haven't even got through my first one. We got to go out tonight. Well, that's on you. Oh, I had a man. small one because I knew we'd be going out tonight, Drew. We haven't been out on a Saturday night in a really long time, so we're going tonight. And I'm excited about it. But that's why I'm. That's why I'm. Keeping it small. Okay. You already had two big jars full of shit. <laughs> yeah, you can go take a nap. It'll be all right. Yeah. All right. So that'll do it for this old timey 
true crime episode. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Remember, if you like the show, to like, share, subscribe on all your social media and share with all your friends and neighbors and acquaintances and even people you don't like. I don't give a shit. <laughs> share with everybody. And if you'd like to financially support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast or you can go to our blog which is 13 o'clock podcast dot wordpress.com you keep moving and you're making the fucking, I'm doing what I want to do uh, you're making the autofocus okay, okay, okay. stop it yeah, I'm gonna leave <laughs> okay <laughs> I'm gonna leave he's messing up my autofocus I gotta go then yeah, he's, <laughs> oh, he's getting all butter. Yeah, he's down he's better bye anyway as I was saying Go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account where you can give a one-time donation if you would like to do that. Please check out our Zazzle store at zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. Hopefully all the shirts are visible now. Uh -huh. if, uh, if that works out okay. I can't believe I, it took me this long to figure the fuck out why nobody could see shit. Uh, also check out our last movie review, which was Reanimator. We'll probably be doing more classic 80s horror over the next few weeks because of our Shutter subscription. They have a really good selection of classic 80s horror on there. So we're going to be doing a lot of those. And I think that'll do it for episode 112. We will see you next time. Bye. The Ballad of Bell Gunners begins after the flames Saps him through the ashes for her family's remains Three children and her all had been claimed, but Bell's was.